Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Titan Sports for the spring semester. I'm Francisco Molina. Hey, everyone. I'm Colin Costian. How's it going? I'm Noah Scobio. And I'm Eddie Brueger. We're here to get the ball rolling to provide you with your weekly sports updates. Welcome to Titan Sports. This past weekend, the National Hockey League hosted two outdoor games as part of their stadium series. The two games were played at MetLife Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. The first game was between the New Jersey Devils and the Philadelphia Flyers. The second game was between the New York Islanders and the New York Rangers. Nico Heischer would score the second fastest goal in NHL outdoor history, just 32 seconds into the game for the Devils. Heischer would finish the, or with three points and the Devils would not look back as they went on to defeat the Flyers by a final of 6-3. The Rangers were down by three goals at one point, but scored twice in the last four minutes to force overtime with the Islanders. Just 10 seconds into overtime, Artemi Panarin would win it for the Rangers. The overtime goal was, re was reviewed because the net came off before the puck crossed the line, but the goal was upheld. The Detroit Red Wings and the Columbus Blue Jackets are set to face off at Ohio Stadium for the 2025 Stadium Series. The Indiana Pacers hosted the 73rd NBA All-Star Game on Sunday night. A total of 397 points were scored, beating the record of 374 set in 2017. The East would beat the West by a final score of 211 to 186. Damian Lillard would be named the MVP of the All-Star Game. He scored 39 points for the East and was 11 of 23 from three-point range. Lillard would also score twice from half court. The East would make a total of 42 three-pointers, beating the previous record of 35. Lillard, who won the three-point shooting title the night before the All-Star Game, is the first player to win an event and the MVP in the same weekend since Michael Jordan accomplished this feat in 1988. The 2025 NBA All-Star Game will be hosted by the Warriors in San Francisco. The All-Star Weekend will consist of events on Saturday night and the game happening Sunday. A legend was born on February 15th as Iowa's women's basketball star, Caitlin Clark, surpasses the NCAA scoring record on a historic night. Clark passes former record holder, Kelsey Plum, for the all-time leading scorer in NCAA women's basketball. The night belongs to Clark and her team as the number four Iowa Hawkeyes defeat Michigan 106-89 at home. The former record for the most all-time points was 3,527 points needed eight points to break the record, it was clear that the team wanted her to get the record as soon as possible. With only the first three minutes of the game, Clark passed the record by taking a three-pointer from the logo. The limelight did not burn the superstar as she finished the first quarter with 23 points, going eight for 10 on the field. After the game, Clark commented on her fantastic night, saying, quote, I don't know you could script it any better. Just to do it in this fashion, I'm very grateful and thankful to be surrounded by so many people who have been my foundation in everything I've done. Since I was a young little girl, you all knew I was going to shoot the Logo 3 for the record, end quote. On top of breaking the national record, Clark also broke her personal record, finishing the game with a career-high 49 points. In her upcoming games, she, she is expected to surpass the all-time Division I record in points held by LSU legend Pete Markovich, a record in a time where the three-point shot wasn't invented. Although it is Clark's fourth season with the Hawkeyes, she has an extra year of eligibility due to COVID-19. Clark has the choice to break more and its 10 records to new heights or prepare for the draft as she is expected to be the number one pick. The CSUF men's golf team must be feeling like the Chicago Bulls in 97 and 98 as they win their third consecutive OC Collegiate Classic in Dana Point. With a rough beginning into the tournament, trailing Cal State Northridge in the first two rounds, the Titans would finish strong in the final round, overtaking the Matadors by three strokes. The Titans get the win with an overall team score of 15 under par 825. The individual title would belong to CSUN's Felix Schrott, 
sweeping the individual leaderboards with overall scores of 12 under par 198. Coming in second would be UC San Diego's Davis McDowell, scoring 10 under par 200. Third place came into a tie with Cal State Fullerton's Russ Howlett and UC Irvine's Ray Harashima with a score of 6 under par 204. Howlett's performance is what lifted the Titans in position to win. Hitting bogeys, double bogeys, and quadruple bogeys in the first couple of rounds, Howlett needed to work his way back to help the team's overall score. Near the end of the second round, he did just that, scoring five clutch birdies in the back ninth. This late stretch in the tournament ultimately helped the team secure the victory. The Titans would also have two more athletes finishing in the top 10, with junior Trevor McNary tying for seventh and Garrett Bowe tying for ninth. Other notable Titans, Tegan Andrews and Howard Yoon tied for 15th, scoring one over par to 11. Congratulations, Titans, on getting a third consecutive OC Collegiate Classic. All right, stay tuned for our roundtable discussion coming up right after the break. Our game we've seen obviously it was a historic performance i believe you mentioned it was 397 points I, yeah you mentioned that and then so we've seen a lot of the criticism lately has been the level of competition within the all-star game so based on what you saw and the entertainment level of it would you like to see more of competitive edge absolutely growing up i had the privilege of watching kobe bryant kevin garnett a young LeBron James in the early thousands of what was the NBA All-Star Game, mm. very competitive. And it was a lot about bragging rights, East versus West. However, in the past 10, 15 years, we've kind of seen that go. They've kind of walked away from that competitive nature, and now it's more of just shooting threes. Uh, I think Damian Lillard hit, hit a couple of those half-court shots. Mm. And there isn't that competitive fire with it. And you know what the ironic thing about this is, is that the ratings came out for the NBA All-Star Game, and it's the highest ratings they've had in about four to five years. So clearly more people are watching it. However, the quality of the product that we're watching, I do believe needs to find a more of a competitive edge. And that is something that uh, Commissioner Silver needs to figure out because I guess I'm an old timer, but old timers like me uh, want to see more of that competitive nature that I saw growing up. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have to agree. It's kind of out of hand. It is very uncom uncompetitive. If the NBA can put as much detail in the NBA trophies, they can do as much detail in the NBA All-Star format. They need to start the change right now. Yeah, I agree with that. I just think there should be more of a focus on defense rather than just kind of showing off. And obviously the players are playing hard, but as we discussed before, the competitive edge might not be there. And I, it kind of makes me think about the uh, NHL, or excuse me, NFL Pro Bowl and how they have theirs at the end of the season and it doesn't include players that are gonna be starting in the Super Bowl. So I think possibly, in my opinion, that might have something to do with the player's performance in the All-Star game as well, is that they may not want to risk injuries as they're not at the end of their season. They still have a lot of games to go. So I think that might be a reason for them not wanting to compete or push themselves as hard. Yeah, and I like that you brought up the point about players not wanting to get injured, because I think it's pretty obvious. Like, you'd watch, there's a lot of players like, I mean, we all like Jokic, but we know right. how his style of play, he's very mm -hmm. casual, very lazy. When yeah. I'm just watching him like sluggishly dribbling the ball and then just <laughs> not even wanting to throw a dunk up or anything, just like, it's it's cool to bring in. I think the big reason what you had mentioned with viewership was in part because it was like an East versus West. I think bringing that format mm -hmm. back really helped, but I think it was yes. important that you had mentioned the injury aspect. I think that's probably the biggest reason. And then also, limited minutes for everybody, including mm -hmm. those starters. And it kind of sucks for the fans because they're paying a bunch of money. 
Yeah. Well, if we're talking about competitive athletes, we gotta talk about Caitlin Clark. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned record-breaking performance. We've seen, obviously, how she's changed the game, bringing so much viewership to women's basketball, and eventually it's gonna carry over when she does go to the WNBA. My first question is, you had mentioned the COVID uh, eligibility. Mm -hmm. Do you think she's gonna stay another year? We know about the NIL deal for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. I think she's a homegrown uh, Iowa person, and she wants to finish what she started. Also, uh, she is the number one uh, NAL athlete, according to Fanatics. She passed a uh, Colorado quarterback, Shadur Sanders. So she has enough income coming in so that she can stay for one more year. Kind of hopping on to that. I did the research last year. Here are these numbers. Erica Wheeler, the highest paid WNBA player, had an annual salary of $242,000 uh, with $242,154. Caitlin Clark, excuse me, Angel Reese from LSU. This wasn't even Caitlin Clark. This is Angel Reese's money last year. She made $1.7 million at Louisiana State University. So if you're Caitlin Clark, do not go to the w WNBA <laughs> right now. Do not, because they're, you're, not, you're gonna make maybe a fifth of what you're making right now. And plus, you're in Iowa. Every, there's not much to do in Iowa. Yeah, but what, there's corn. Exactly, there's <laughs> corn and then there's basketball yeah. games, right? So she or is the, football games, exactly. Yeah. She is the main event. Everyone's talking about it. Take your time, enjoy your collegiate oh, yeah. life, and you're gonna be making top dollar right now. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Just uh, staying in college for the one more year of eligibility. You often see, um, I assume with coll uh, college basketball as well, but I've seen it with college football, a lot of players entering the transfer portal and going to other schools or just choosing to go into the draft early without finishing out their legacy. And I think it's just better for the image for Caitlin and the image for Iowa as well to just finish it out and then get on with wherever she wants to go. Yeah, and another thing that I really like is that I never really paid attention to like college basketball in a while. I used to watch both when I was younger, but now I feel like she has really brought me back into that. Watching her in the tournament last year for March Madness, uh, like her game obviously reminded me of Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. And that actually leads me into kind of my next question. Like we've seen how Curry's changed the game, but do we feel like she is also gonna change the game for women's basketball in a similar fashion to Steph? Absolutely. I think that we're looking at a huge group of young talent for the WNBA. I think the most talent we've ever seen. Right. Uh, Kelsey Plum, she hasn't been in the WNBA for that long. But these, the difference, one of the biggest differences between the NBA and the WNBA, in my opinion, is that WNBA athletes uh, statistically stay longer in college, right? So they develop themselves a lot more as right. a basketball player as a whole compared to the NBA, uh, to men's college basketball. So when Caitlin Clark decides to go to the WNBA, she's gonna be a lot more ready to go, a lot more competitive mm -hmm. than these one and, done, one and done athletes that we see the Dukes of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So when Caitlin Clark transitions and makes that change, we're gonna see competitive basketball right off the get-go. And I think that we are about to see the golden era of the WNBA. Yeah, perfect example. The player that comes to mind is Sabrina Unesca. Mm -hmm. She finished all four years at Oregon. She broke so many records. Now she's one of the premier athletes in the WNBA right now. And like you said, when they're most groomed in the in the WNBA, in the college basketball and then when they transfer, they're unstoppable. She already broke so many records in, in her first year that I think Caitlin Clark and her are going to be unstoppable. Yeah, and I really like you guys mentioned the golden rule. I'm really excited to see the future of not even just women's basketball, or like not even the NCAA and college basketball, but just women's basketball in general. Right. And now as we transition into something that's approaching right around the corner, the baseball diamond. So we already know spring, gating, or spring training games sorry, start this week. Um, what are your just general expectations, you think, for the MLB this year? And in particular, I know a lot of us are Dodger fans. So what are our expectations for that as well? I'm going to gonna let Mr. Baseball take this one right here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the uh, Spring Training 2024 Cactus League and the uh, Florida League starts this week. Uh, with the Angels starting up with the Angels, they have a brand new season, brand new roster with not only Ron Washington at the helm, but Mike Trout and Logan Hoppy and Zach Neto. Uh, the four players that need to improve for the Angels are Joe Odell, Michael Stefanik, and more. And then with the Dodgers, of course, Shohei Otani, big signing. Yamamoto class now. But the thing that questions to me is the rotation. What is Dave Roberts and Mark Pryor gonna do? Because they have nine starting pitchers that I counted on the roster for the spring training. So they're gonna have a difficult time to see, okay, this player goes in the rotation or that player goes in the bullpen. 
I'm going to love to see what they can do. I think what I'm expecting this upcoming year is Dodgers, 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 and every headline in every <laughs> sports, everywhere right. I go, because they dominated the offseason yeah. with the Otani contract. The way it was structured, nobody saw that coming. And being able to pick up Yamamoto as well, seeing that, uh, that chemistry that those two already had in the World Baseball Classic. So I'm really intrigued to see how they do. But also the Yankees, they had some acquisitions over the offseason as well. Juan Soto. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we'll, they made some noise. I know it's not the noise that Yankee fans wanted right. to hear, mm -hmm. but they made some noise overall. And I, I'm not saying that they're going to go far, but I'm actually expecting a solid season from the Angels. Mm -hmm. It looks like their leadership is trying to go in a different direction in this post-Otani era. And, I mean, it's down the street, and it's going to be affordable tickets, so you'll see me at Angel yeah, Stadium. You know? <laughs> unlike unlike uh, Chavez Ravine, where it's going to be about 10 Ten times the price. Yeah. yeah. And that's another really unfortunate part, though, is like it is going to be harder to see Dodger games. But I think what I'm really most excited about, obviously, besides the Otani trade, I'm really excited that we have a rotation this year. That's been the biggest thing. I would, in the postseason last year, you had two healthy starters. You had, well, now right. I'm not even going to count Kershaw because he was mm -hmm. not, he was definitely not healthy. Uh, like you had Bobby Miller and then Lance Lynn. And or they, Gavin Stone. Gavin Stone, who basically yeah. didn't really. Do much. He didn't really get a he, he he's somebody to look forward to in the future for sure. Mm -hmm. But I definitely am excited about that. Having a rotation is key running down towards the end of the season and it's right. always been a problem for the Dodgers. So I'm really just excited to see how the rotation does this year. All right, Titans, that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Colin Costigan. Hope to see you again. I'm Francisco Molina. Thank you for watching. I'm Noah Scobio. And I'm Eddie Bruger. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter if you haven't already at CSUF. Titan Sports to keep you updated on all things sports.